Okay, I will start. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the fourth session of the Humor Book Lunch. This is a forum of acknowledgement of critical, um, of critical, of a critical engagement of work that's being produced in and on the African continent, especially relevant to the humor intellectual agenda. Today, our guest is Dr. Verena Krebs, presenting her book, uh, Medieval Ethiopian Kingship craft and diplomacy with Latin Europe. This book explores why the kings of Solomonic Ethiopia pursued long distance diplomatic contacts with Latin Europe in the 15th and early 16th centuries and how more than a dozen, a dozen embassies sent out by the Christian kings were connected to local political and developments in the Ethiopian Highlands. highlands from the building of monumental royal churches and monasteries to Solomonic ideas on kinship and sovereignty. Dr. Krebs holds a professorship for the medieval cultural realms and their entanglements at Ruhr University Bochum, Germany, where she co-directs the Bochum Center for Mediterranean Studies. She obtained her binational PhD in history from the universities of Constance, Germany, and Macau, Ethiopia, followed by a postdoc in Jerusalem. Her primary research focus, <coughs> excuse me, her primary research focus is on the late medieval Solomonic kingdom of Ethiopia and its connections to the wider Mediterranean region. In 2021, she published her first academic monograph, uh, the book that she will present, Medieval Ethiopian Kinship, Craft and Diplomacy, with Palgrave Macmillan, which is the one, uh, as I said, that she's, she will present. She is currently completing a second monograph and uh, this monograph examines Solomonic patronage in the late 15th and early 16th century pre preliminary titled Africa Collecting Europe. Both monographs are uh, have uh, um, a link to her PhD, but they fully are independent studies shedding new light into the cultural history of late medieval Solom uh, Solomonic Ethiopia. Dr. Krebs is also working with Dr. Yonatan uh, Binyam from uh, Penn State University on a handbook titled Ethiopia and the World which offers uh, an accessible introduction for non-specialist uh, historians and other interested readers to the history of the Ethiopian Eritrean uh, Highland Plateau. This uh, handbook will be published next year at, by the Cambridge University Press. She's joined today by a historian from Addis Ababa uh, called Hewan Simon in this discussion. And um, we're looking forward to hearing more about the history of uh, Ethiopia and its diplomacy with Europe. Thank you so much, Dr. Krebs. Thank you so much, Hewan, for joining us. You're welcome to take the floor, Dr. Krebs. We look forward to hearing about your book. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Let me just share my screen because I've prepared a PowerPoint and let's go back to the start. So. Um, Thank you very much for this uh, very lovely introduction and it's my great honor to, well, try really to summarize in broad strokes um, the results of the research project that has taken up the better part of the last 12 years uh, and most of my life as a graduate student as a re and as a researcher thus far. Um, and it is uh, the first of two books that looks uh, at how kingship, power and material, cultural, uh, material culture interacted in Solomonic Christian Ethiopia between the very early 15th century and the 1530s. Uh, my, my sincere hope is that this book offers a new way of looking at Ethiopian history in the 15th and early 16th century in a period generally termed the late Middle Ages by transcultural historians, uh, historians for intelligibility um, by looking closely at a specific aspect of Ethiopian history at this time, namely uh, a good dozen diplomatic missions sent out from Solomonic Ethiopia to Latin Europe. The book thus uses the lens of this long distance diplomacy to, to draw out what we can learn about local Ethiopian history in the 15th and early 16th century more broadly, and is specifically interested what we can learn about Solomonic Christian kingship, 
and about how Solomonic kings saw themselves and their place in the world. Um, for that reason, uh, the first three major chapters uh, of the book offer a rereading of the source material that we have on all of these diplomatic embassies that were sent out by the Ethiopian kings in this time. And many of um, these sources have actually been known for quite a long time. So to paint a very brief uh, or broad picture for you, um, between the year 1400 and the late 1520, so for a period of 120 years, Ethiopian kings sent out numerous diplomatic missions to very different places in Latin Europe. Uh, oh, so that was the book cover, but here we go with the slides. Um, so they sent out uh, numerous diplomatic missions to different places, as you can see from this map. Uh, and depending on how we count, the number of these missions varies, but at the very least, it's about a dozen embassies sent out from the Ethiopian court. And as you can see, Ethiopian um, diplomats, Ethiopian ambassadors, sometimes also Ethiopian pilgrims acting as ambassadors, uh, appear in very different places from the Italian peninsula from the Italian peninsula to modern day Germany, to the very west of the Iberian Peninsula. So really moving from all over um, the European continent and particularly Western Europe. Now, continuous and lasting contacts between distant medieval royal courts are far from surprising. Um, as art historian Finbar Flood has rightly pointed out, people and things have been mixed up for a very long time and they rarely conform to the boundaries of, uh, imposed upon them by modern anthropologists and historians. However, in this specific case, people and things had to travel thousands of miles to mix up between Ethiopia and the Latin West. Um, they needed to cross mountain ranges, deserts, and two rather large bodies of water. And even at the very best of times, a single journey would take at least half a year. And yet, if we look at, look at the sources, uh, nearly all rulers and regions of the 15th and early 16th century sent out envoys to Latin Europe in some way, which leads to the question at the heart of the book. Why? Why did generations of Ethiopian kings send out their emissaries? And why did they initiate contacts time and again with different princely and ecclesiastical courts in Europe? Sadly, there are no actual letters written by the Ethiopian kings that have come down to us for the first 100 years of missions, but there's a whole wealth of other texts. There's administrative notes and copies of official letters, treasure records, city annals, chronicles, itineraries, diary entries, personal letter collections, and even cartouche legends on maps. The written, in source, uh, the written sources come from Ethiopia, but they also come from Egypt and particularly from Latin Europe, where they're written in is Arabic, also Latin, Italian, Catalan, German, French, and Portuguese. And about 80% of the source evidence we have is written in European languages. So it's mostly the copies, for example, of letters that were sent from, an, uh, from a European court to the King of Ethiopia. And some of these sources have been known for a very long time, actually most of them. Uh, but like a particularly important Arabic source, some have also been rather recently discovered in this case by French historian um, Julien Lozot. So, um, and what all of these texts and all of these sources do contain is a wealth of circumstantial evidence that provides a view on the desires and interests of the Ethiopian kings in the 15th century. So what the first few chapters of the book then does is offer a chronological rereading and re-evaluation of the source material that we do have. And here I've been trying to strip away the Latin Christian hopes and imaginings and knowledge, quote unquote, about Ethiopia. I am profoundly uninterested in contributing one more narrative about how Western European Christians understood the world that they knew actually very little about. Moreover, Mamluk Egypt and Solomonic Ethiopia had their very, uh, very own long and complicated, uh, pragmatic, largely amicable history in this time. But occasionally we do find some very real Mamluk Egyptian fears, theories and suspicions in the source material. These, again, I try to critically evaluate and see what remains if we strip all of that away, if we focus on the common threads, the repeated Solomonic interests things that appear time and time and time again in the sources. So what remains and what was it all about? What remains is actually quite startling. 
Um, it is an incredible, very palpable Ethiopian interest in foreign religious Christian material culture, particularly in relics, ecclesiastical garments, fine fabrics, liturgical objects, so everything kingly and prestigious. Another interest lay in the acquisition of builders, stonemasons, painters, carpenters, gold and silversmiths, and thus artisans and craftsmen skilled in, tra uh, in trades necessary to construct architectural monuments. Like a golden thread, these interests, these palpable Solomonic requests, run through each and every late medieval Ethiopian embassy, both in the 15th and even in the 16th century. Crucially, these findings are at a very stark contrast of what decades of earlier research has suggested for the better part of the century. In a major 14, uh, 1945 article, the Italian historian uh, Renato Lefebvre uh, opined that the Ethiopian kings had first approached medieval Italy out of the need for its quote unquote, artistically and technological superior workforce ostensibly caused by a lack of skilled local African labor. Two decades later, the same man, Renato Lefebvre, uh, stated somewhat less bluntly that Solomonic rulers dispatched their missions out of a desire to obtain masters of art and industry to quote unquote, raise the civil and technical level of the Ethiopian kingdom driven by a need to enhance its military efficiency. It is impossible not to see the long shadow and the direct through line of colonialist thought underlying such assumptions. Yet in his groundbreaking work on early uh, on medieval Solomonic history of uh, 1972, the great Ethiopian historian Tadesse Tamrat largely followed uh, Lefebvre's uh, interpretation he too assumed that the delegation's purpose had been to ask for artisan technologists, military experts, and access to European technology. It is very hard to overstate how both scholars view have impacted the field. Between the uh, 1980s and now, scholarship has largely and uniformly asserted that Solomonic missions to Europe were tied to a desire to obtain craftsmen technologists, a need for European quote unquote technology and arms, and a desire for military alliances with the Christian powers of the Western Mediterranean. But reading and re-evaluating these sources, I have to say all of the above, the arms, the craftsmen, technologists, the military matters, they're utterly absent. They're just not there in the first sources for the first 100 years of Solomonic outreach. They do appear in the 19th century, Atzalip Nadengel is actually really interested in military matters and alliances, but even then, they are part of a larger list of requests that he issues, which once again centers on building related craftsmanship. Even in the early 1500s, on the eve of a series of devastating wars with the former Solomonic tributary, Sultan of Adal, Ethiopian King Libnadengel asks first and foremost for the following. He asks for the dispatch of painters, sculptures, stonemasons, carpenters, gold and silversmiths, bookmakers, gold leaf specialists, engravers, metal workers, roofers, architects, glass blowers, and tile makers from both Portugal and the papacy. He also asks for rugs and large scale embroidered cur curtains that he explicitly wants to use in churches and statues of the Virgin and Saints. So what the book seeks to do is highlight these amazing through lines that connect Ethiopian embassies to the Latin West from the time of Dawid in the year 1400 to his great, great, great grandson, Lipna Dengel. Uh, so 120 years time. Here, it seems to me that Ethiopian rulers were primarily interested in acquiring building related labor, as well as relics and crucially foreign religious material culture, fine fabrics and liturgical objects which as the fifth and the last and most crucial chapter of the book, which was supplied, um, I think, by Huma on the website, uh, then points out, fits all rather well into the local history of Ethiopia in this time. In the latter half of the 14th century, the consolidation of Solomonic Christian power over most of the central Northeast African highlands had ushered in substantial religious reforms, but also the local translation and flourishing of religious literature as the research of French historian Marie-Laure Dera has shown, the 15th and early 16th century in particular witnessed also a period of monumental building activity in the central 
Ethiopian Highland Plateau, we find dozens um, of royal prestigious churches and monasteries that were being built, and they were a material testament to the Solomonic King's supreme political claim of power and a physical assertion of each sovereign's rightful and just Christian rulership. Such royal religious centers not only had to be built and ornamented, they of course also had to be endowed and furnished with precious books, with ecclesiastical fabrics, uh, with fine materials, liturgical utensils, relics, and also icons. The last chapter of the book thus argues that we need to read the concurrent diplomatic relations between Solomonic Ethiopia and the Latin West against this backdrop of royal monumental building. We need to read it against the process of local state religious state building and of asserting Christian suzerainty on local Solomonic subjects at home in the Ethiopian highlands. In, con uh, in contrasting what we know of the embassies with what we know of the local Ethiopian history of this time, drawing from material, but also from written sources, um, it seems to me what must have been the driving factor of the first 100 years of Solomonic diplomacy becomes visible here. And I argue it must have been the acquisition of these objects and this building related manpower that was uh, of interest to the Ethiopian kings, specifically for aesthetic and dynastic purposes, because militaristic acquisitiveness plays absolutely no role here. It is also important to say that acquiring artisans and precious wares from faraway places would have increased any king's local prestige. We find this throughout the European Middle Ages. Um, it is a very common request. It is what one does as a good king to engage with other kings in an exchange. Um, because it follows a mechanism well attested for numerous societies in the pre-modern world. If you can obtain something from very far, it heightens your local prestige. But in this specific case, there's also a more interesting, specifically Ethiopian Solomonic aspect to be found here. In late medieval Ethiopia, we find a heterogeneous kingdom whose rulers saw themselves as the true heirs of Solomon, and as the first of all of the Christian kings of the earth. The very process of approaching a foreign court to ask for artisans and builders would have emulated actions ascribed to the biblical King Solomon, propagated by the Ethiopian rulers as their dynasty's genealogical and spiritual ancestor in their foundational myth of the Kebrenegast. It could very well be that the sending of missions to Latin Christian courts would have locally asserted Solomonic claim of Solomonic descendants. What we do know, and what I try to show in the book, is that these parallels were readily uh, apparent, not just to the Ethiopian kings, but also to their people. They were even apparent to foreign kings in Europe, on whom stories of Solomonic descent, as based on the Kebrenegest, had been impressed by the Ethiopian ambassadors. And this gives us a view on how the Ethiopian kings understood themselves and their place in the world as the first Christian kings in all the kingdoms of men, building magnificent churches instead of temples to assert their divine, divinely sanctioned power. What this lastly to conclude does is not just revise our ideas about Solomonic kingship in this period. I think it also sheds new and rather different light onto African and European encounters in a time that is still often called and defined by the European age of exploration. I hope for the uh, history of Ethiopia especially, that it might also give us a new framework for seeing and, un and understanding the local concurrent material culture of the kingdom at this time. Because here we find imported and even specifically commissioned religious objects from Europe from very, very far away places that have come into royal Ethiopian hands in the late 15th and early 16th century, much to the puzzlement of historians and art historians. But against the framework of the book, such objects become much less puzzling. They become one more aspect of a very rich Ethiopian kingdom, looking both outwards and inwards in the late Middle Ages. And that's something I hope to study in the second book that I'm currently in the process of finishing. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Krebs, for sharing that very special, very informative and important history on uh, 
Solomonic kinship, which I had no idea about as I was reading your book. I was, I was, I was just everything started to make sense because I, I am from a Christian background, and obviously having uh, read several chapters of, of the Bible, things started to make sense. And I, I, I highly appreciate um, your text, which I will, I hope to, to complete in due time. I'm really curious to hear about um, what Hewan's reflection or um, thoughts are on this text. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, sadly, but I will um, okay. read the word file I have, and I hope if I'm going too fast, please do interrupt me. All right. And so these would be some of my reflections and comments and uh, general background as someone who focuses on modern Ethiopian history. Uh, so we begin. A prominent intellectual and scholar of 20th century Ethiopia, a man called Hirui Waldesilasi, begins his history of Ethiopian monarchs by providing the lineage of Queen Makeda, the mother of Minilik I. Minilik was born from King Solomon of Jerusalem, who is in turn the son of King David. Minilik is believed to have brought the Ark of the Covenant from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, marking a symbolic shift. Ethiopia was now the chosen land of Christianity and its rulers, protectors of the faith. This is the foundational legend of the rulers of Ethiopia who claim to be of the Solomonic dynasty. They trace their lineage to the house of David and claim preeminence according to this legend found in the book, The Kibranagast. Though the dynasty has had its moments of economic and political glory, as well as catastrophe, war and devastation, since its founding in 1270, the legend has persisted up until the 20th century and arguably even does today. Emperor Haile Selassie, who was deposed in 1974, makes the last official Solomonic ruler of Ethiopia. From the late 13th until the 20th century, the Solomonids played a leading role in the political history of Ethiopia. Their legend was not confined to the Horn of Africa, but was also spread all the way to Latin Europe as Verena Krebs shows in her book. She writes, in 1428, Alfonso V of Aragon addressed Aze Yusak as heir to the throne of David and stated that the Nugus possessed the tablets of Mount Sinai, that is the Ark of the Covenant. This is from page 218 in the book, just to quote. <laughs> Ethiopian rulers ensured that those they made contact with knew of their place in the world. Among their marks is the relationship they developed with Christianity and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, a remarkable feature of which was their attempt to control and negotiate power and politics with the church through land grants known as Gult. This tradition has also survived up until the 20th century. They also had a tradition of building royal religious centers and magnificent churches and monasteries to affirm their rightful claim to the Solomonic throne. They aspired to be like King Solomon and to beautify their churches like perhaps the Temple of Solomon. As clearly demonstrated in Verena's book, 14th, 15th and 16th century Solomonic rulers were engaged in building impressive religious sites to host their bodies upon death, to celebrate and commemorate saints and for other religious purposes. Verena's recurring and primary thesis in the book is that the established scholarly view that Ethiopian rulers of these centuries reached out to Latin Europe for military assistance is divorced from available source evidence and local historical context. Granted, the Solomonids up until the 16th century were engaged in aggressive consolidation of their power across lands they ruled and expanded to. However, but Verena's book shows that instead of martial demands, the Ethiopians primarily demanded artisans skilled in construction or ornamentation, religious wear and items such as chalices, censers, beautiful carpets to drape their churches, and relics that could raise the significance of religious sites from Europe. This, she explains, is not because cultural exchange necessarily meant locals were surrendering to superior power from abroad, but because such links were demonstrations of a ruler's might and reach. The book's value is precisely in reassessing a view held about medieval Ethiopian relations with Europe and their implications for Ethiopian realities in the Horn of Africa. The book is complemented with a meticulous analysis of sources in Latin and Greek, as well as archaeological evidence and historical rereading of foundational works of Ethiopian history. She aptly demonstrates that while rulers of parts of Europe believed romantic ideals about a figure believed to be 
Prester John that would help them in their crusades against the Moors or the Mohammedans in the Muslim Eastern Mediterranean or largely the Middle East, the Ethiopians were at first neither facing threats from their Muslim neighbors and disciples, nor were they interested in a universal Christian war that Europe might have wanted. And even with the fall of Constantinople and the frantic calls from Europe for Ethiopia to join in a military alliance against the Ottomans and the Mamluks, the Ethiopians chose to ignore these pleas. Yet obviously they had their own agendas in certain contexts and as part of a general power strategy. But the Ethiopians primarily reached out to Europe according to their desires and interests, which were in tune with their own rule within the country they administered. I would like here to remark that the relationship between Islam and Christianity is an interesting matter altogether. We read in the book that while Europe wanted financial and military assistance from this Northeast African sovereign in the early 15th century against Muslim powers, Ethiopian embassies were often an interfaith collaboration. Muslim merchants and Christian ecclesiastics were sent to Latin Europe on account of often the same ruler. This has to do with the complex relationship with the patriarchate in Egypt, the Christian church, which is an Arabic speaking one within a Muslim polity, of course. And this is not to hide the reality of the geopolitics of the time. The Solomonic rulers were engaged in campaigns against the Adal with weapons and horses acquired from Egypt, Persia, and sometimes even the Levant. But with their military needs satisfied to the East, Verena shows that Ethiopia did not need to reach out to the West for similar purposes. This would change towards the end of the 16th century during the time of Queen Eleni, the mother to Emperor Libna Dingil, who would have to face devastating wars of the Adal by Ahmed the left-handed or in Amharic, he's known as Ahmed Gray. But Verena shows that even in times of looming danger and conflict, Libna Dingil was still requesting craftsmen and relics from Europe. We read of the magnificence of the churches that were built during the time from Futuha al Habesha, whereby Ahmed's men speak of the glory of some of the churches they would eventually burn down. And here we have to also be aware of the literary topos, of course, what is destroyed, conquered, and so on, must always be great and magnificent. We also are provided evidence from Alvarez's accounts, as well as Giz's chronicles and archaeological evidence to support her claim about the engagement of the Solomonic rulers in the Ethiopian church. As someone who's focused on the modern history of Ethiopia, that is the 1850s roughly until today, there are several interesting matters to think about. One is the relationship Ethiopia held with Italy prior to the 19th century. Ethiopians approached the Latin West selectively and purposefully, Verena writes, at times pushing the Latin West to desperation. We are not presented here with a European power condescendingly reaching out to an African power, as we would assume based on our understanding of 20th century African European relations, but rather rulers who considered one another equals and allies through faith communicating, although granted most of the times neither side fully understood the other. Another interesting matter is the case of land grants and land. As shown in chapter five of Verena's book, land itself is a major aspect of power in politics. When considering land and the churches that were actively built by the early Solomonic, their significance also to the study of contemporary Ethiopian history cannot be overstated. Modern Ethiopian rulers who also claimed to be Solomonic rulers sought to reclaim land that was lost during the Adal Wars and the following Oromo migrations. Sites of one standing churches were among the legitimizing factors of expansion of the Ethiopian kingdom since while the founder of modern Ethiopia, Emperor Theodros II, was engaged in his own internal battle to consolidate his throne, he had to primarily prove that he was one of Solomonic blood and then vouched to reclaim the throne of his fathers and rule all of the land they once did, and even Jerusalem. Beyond these symbolic gestures and declarations, Emperor Theodros' successors, and especially those in central and southern Ethiopia now, the Shawa rulers who also claim Solomonic blood, were actively engaged in a southward expansion and rebuilding of land they considered theirs. Part of how they went about it was by using churches as flag posts of once existing territorial ownership and by constructing new churches wherever they saw fit. A third and final interesting point to consider is the nature of diplomacy in the modern period. Here lies a major difference. Modern Ethiopian Solomonic rulers 
were no longer reaching out to Europe only for religious treasures and relics or simply construction related manpower. In the 19th and 20th centuries, Ethiopian rulers would be acutely aware of Europe's technological power and sought for artisans that would teach their citizens how to manufacture weapons primarily, tools and various such technologies. Of course, the modern period has its own complicated realities, but this is to simply show some of the ways one can think of Solomonic rulers and their successors in the modern period. Returning finally to Verena's book, the significance of the book is in primarily collecting and ordering all evidences or as much evidence as possible for the history of the 14th and 15th centuries in redirecting us from an overarching assumption about the nature of the relationship between an African dynasty and European rulers. And finally, in pushing historians of various periods of Ethiopia to consider seriously the myths the legends and the prophecies of the country that, that may be factors in animating Ethiopian rulers and Ethiopians. I would like to end with congratulating Verena on a great achievement here. Many things. Yes, congratulations, Verena. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for this amazing, and I'm not even just saying it, I think it's, it's an incredible book. Um, yeah, I think it's a really important book to to really think about or reconceptualize the diplomacy between these two particular regions, you know, between the Horn of Africa and 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 Europe, and and think from the context of you know Ethiopia, what what those relations were versus what um, um, the prevailing history might have might have said, and I. I really appreciate this 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 text. I don't have any question right now. I'm still uh, processing everything, but I, I'd like to open uh, um, Q and A to the floor. Does anyone uh, have a question? If you do have a comment or a question, please uh, indicate by raising your hand on the emoticon or inserting your question or comment in the chat. Okay, while we wait for, oh, there we Claire. go. Okay, Claire, you're welcome to ask a question. Claire is our one of our postdoctoral fellows at Huma. Thank you so much. That was, that was so fascinating. Um, both of your presentations were incredible. Um, I actually really want to read the book now. Um, my question um, is more general, like out of just general interest about the period and the, the 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 relationship between the two regions, and it res revolves around the question of race. Um, obviously, our racial conceptions and concepts of what we use now were different then. And I would like to know um, what were, how was race thought about during that period, if at all? Um, how was difference constructed? Um, yeah, just some information on that would be really interesting thanks mm -hmm. um, yeah that's a question that tends to come up and um, I think it, it tells us more about our current like what what figures prominently on our minds first and foremost and um, I have to say one needs to be specific so there's good there's really excellent new research on race and uh, um, like um, race making in the middle ages now by for example Gerald, uh, Geraldine Heng um, but uh, in the sources that I specifically looked at, it is uh, remarkable to stress that for the first 50 years, which is the majority of the Ethiopian embassies to the Latin West, um, physical differences and dark skin, skin gets mentioned, but it is of no particular import. Um, it's really not important to um, the sources that mention it. So for example, we have a 1404, um, source by an Italian cleric who says how wonderful it is that these four Ethiopian ambassadors who are also clerics and that they are black and bearded, but first and foremost, they are good Christians and they've come here and everybody wants to meet them and they're so interesting because they, like everybody thinks that they're the people of Preston John. And I think that is an important bit as well. So Preston John in Latin Europe at this time has been imagined for a period of 200 years as the most 
powerful, wealthiest, and actually like spiritually best Christian kings on the world. It harkens back to um, uh, like a fake letter, and it's it's a myth that tells us actually more about Europe uh, in the late Middle Ages than anything else. But when the Ethiopian ambassadors come to Europe, they are identified as the people of Prester John. And so they are identified by contemporary Latin Europeans as being the ambassadors of the most important, most uh, militarily um, powerful and wealthiest Christian king in the world. And I think that is an important framework to keep in the back of our minds that um, race and uh, like racialization or um, uh, physical uh, notions of physical difference really sort of are of no great importance beyond the whole being understood as the ambassadors of the most powerful, wealthiest king in the world. Um, and I mean, it changes over the course of the 15th and the particularly the 16th century with, of course, also um, the Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese in West Africa and um, the start of um, the enslavement of uh, West Africans first towards Latin Europe, um, to Portugal and uh, to the Iberian Peninsula, but then also increasingly towards the Atlantic islands. Um, and you see the impact of that, um, but in, especially in the 15th century, um, the fact that Ethiopia is understood as the kingdom of Prester John is of pivotal importance. Thanks so much, it's fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Minga. Minga is one of our doctoral fellows at Huma. Uh, thank you so much for uh, Mimi. And thank you so much for Rena for this wonderful presentation. Actually, I want the book. You know, you've <laughs> actually highlighted a couple of stuff that you know I, uh, I love uh, Ethiopian stories and I, I've been following it up, you know, though I'm not an historian, trying to understand the, the history of, of the country. You mentioned quite a lot of interesting point that I think currently we're having, there's an emerging uh, archives that are coming out in terms of, I think this is where you're tapping into, into in order for us to understand what Ethiopia is about. Uh, when I look at one of the slides that you've shown us, uh, the, the timeline that you, you have there. There was uh, a, a timeline that started from, I think it was... At 1270? Um, yes, some, some, something like that, moved to uh, 1500, somewhere there. So my question is to, how would the history of Ethiopia look like? Before I ask the question first, you know, we have these Time can only exist if we have space. So space get created, then time get also insert and event in between. Mm -hmm. So now, then we have historians that are writing stories, you know, uh, and history and all that. So my question is, how the history of Ethiopia look like if we don't focus on that timeline? Because the timeline frees us to a particular story that we've been told about Ethiopia. And I want to know if there's, if you've tried to, to go a bit more deeper to understand that, because this is a very fascinating book, you know, which I'm, I need to have it, you know. You, you're really going deeper, but I need to know, have you tried to look at that, you know, the other side of the story where the timeline, because the timeline, when you look at it, you know, it focuses more on, if I may use this word, which I think you're challenging it also, uh, the Eurocentrism, Eurocentric way of giving us a story. What would be the historiography of Ethiopia if we don't focus on the timeline that you give, you gave us? You know, and uh, uh, when I listened to a one, uh, she spoke about something very interesting about the land issue. And uh, you say that, you know, land is an aspect of power and politics. 
you know, and she mentioned also the, 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 the issue of how uh, the land was also claimed, you know, through uh, beyond uh, Jerusalem. So I think I need to get your book in order for me to understand because I didn't read the book yet, but this is just the question that I'm asking about the timeline. Aren't we trapped into the same narrative that or reproduce the same thing, but in a different context? Thank you. I think um, it, this is a good question that I don't think I've come across yet. Um, and I am revealing myself as a medievalist here. So as somebody who's very much trained in reading Latin sources and uh, whatnot. Um, but I mean, I have to say uh, Ethiopian chronicles that do date back to the 15th century also focus on the succession in years. So for example, you do have, um, the, for the first 19 years of Libna Dingle's rule, nothing much happened. He was born there and there. He went to that and that monastery in that and that month of that and that year. Um, so that figures very prominently in uh, actually contemporary, like um, 15th century Ethiopian sources themselves. Um, and uh, so it is not contingent upon a Europe-centric narration of time, if that is what you might be getting at. Um, because the, the, I mean, there is differences, of course, between the um, modern calendar we do assume is sort of, a, what do we call it, common era, but it's in fact actually based on the Western Christian calendar. We just pretend it's not religious. Um, but there is, uh, of course, uh, a connection to the Ethiopian calendar at the time. Um, so we can, uh, Ethiopian time of the 15th century, and Hewan maybe can, um, uh, has some other insights there, but it does follow alongside its, its own timeline, which is largely congruent with, um, with spaces that it is connected to. Um, and if we try to step away from it, I would wonder what would happen, because we do have these pivotal moments. I start in fifty uh, in uh, I started the 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 thing in uh, twelve seventy, um, not because of an adherence to Western calendar notions or something, but because it is um, the point when, according to the Ethiopian history of time, a new ruler of a new dynasty comes to power. Um, and this new dynasty then, as new research indicates, actually does everything to um, execute some sort of damnatio memoria to, to possibly the intentional destruction of sources, objects, things belonging to the dynasty that came before them to raise that to the ground in order to frame themselves also as the new and divinely sanctioned actually rulers. So, these points in time are important also to the local Ethiopian history, I would say. Um, but it is an interesting question to keep in the back of my mind because I've just never thought about it. Uh, and for the end point, I mean, I ended the time stream, I think, in the, 15, uh, uh, in the 1530s, because that is once more, there's a pivotal, um, there's a pivotal, uh, what's the English word? A pivotal event uh, in, Ethiopian history at this point, because a series of conflicts that start off somewhat um, uh, like, a, uh, what's the word? They start off um, inspired more by uh, monetary means and uh, see, I do sometimes blank on my English. Um, so uh, it is sort of economically motivated rates, that's the word. Um, economically motivated raids between the Sultanate of Adal, which once was a tributary um, part of the Solomonic Kingdom and the fringes of the Ethiopian Sol uh, Solomonic Kingdom. So these raids do escalate into a full blown set of wars. And these wars then sort of do, I would say, um, actually constitute, they, they're just a break in the timeline because there is a distinct before um, where you have this prosperous Christian kingdom and then you have devastating wars and the son of the previous king comes to power, but he comes to power in a very different world. It's not just that his father's kingdom has really been in large parts um, devastated, 
but also that then the Portuguese are in the Horn of Africa. And that is also, once again, where dynamics of power just fundamentally change. Um, so I, I think we can't quite sort of take these, these pivotal turning points, if you will, that are very much local. We need to keep them in there. May I just add something? Um, and I think this, I started off my presentation discussing a, a traditional Ethiopian historian and an intellectual precisely because the way he writes Ethiopian history itself is uh, very much dependent on the timelines of this king reigned from here until here. He was born from here until here. His successor was this person. And it's very much an Ethiopian traditional way of writing as well. Like th these are fundamental to how traditional Ethiopian historians wrote Ethiopian history, even in the 20th and 20, well, now it's, it's uh, disappearing, but they were very fundamental to studying Ethiopian history. So it's not necessarily a, a European way of uh, studying Ethiopian history but one that is pretty much dependent on, I think, Ethiopians themselves and how they consider their history, if it helps. Yeah, mm. yeah. thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have another question from Solange. Solange, thank you so much for joining us. Could you kindly voice your question to Dr. Krebs? Hi, Verena. Um, it's early here, so I was leaving the camera off, but... Um, I was asking about if you have thoughts about why these Ethiopian kings were asking for gold practitioners, goldsmiths from Europe. Uh, did that mean that there was not also a local tradition of gold working? And I ask in the context of writing and thinking about um, Nubian gold workers from an earlier first to sixth century CE. Um, period. So maybe you could say if they just didn't have this tradition, which strikes me as a little bit strange, or if they were looking for a, a sort of exotic, different European style of gold working. Um, that's a very good question. I make the point several times in the book that none of these requests were because of a lack or dearth of local labor. So, and, and many of these embassies were actually not super successful because um, we know that on their way from Europe to Ethiopia, many actually don't make it. So, um, you know, like the, the, they're like the even if there had been uh, actual European artisans that made their way to Ethiopia, it would have been very few in number. Um, and uh, so everything we know from the Ethiopian cultural production of this time indicates that this was really just an additional request. And I do think that this is very much linked to specifically Solomon requesting also somebody who works in gold from Hiram of Tyre in the Bible several times in two historical books of the Bible. Um, we know that, of course, metalworking is very important in the Ethiopian church. It's important for jewelry. Uh, King Zara Jacob declares that every Christian should wear a sign of his faith. Um, and we do know, of course, that also um, like uh, just working in fine metal in general for many Christian rulers of, of the late Middle Ages is uh, important for jewellery, but also for reliquaries, for example, um, in order to keep relics in, in, in an adequate fashion. But there's more even here because we have a Portuguese, an Arabic and several uh, sources that describe how these Ethiopian churches, these monumental royal dynastic foundations, how they looked like. And the interesting bit is that they were intentionally apparently made like Solomon's first temple. So they're built from these monumental ashlar stones, slabs, uh, but their insides are made from wood. And the insides, the doors, the frames, the pillars of the wood, they're either clad or they're paneled in gold and silver. And on this gold and silver, you have precious jewels and corals and pearls. And that is described, I mean, as Hewan rightly pointed out, there's always, of course, a literary topos of, for example, the, the Arabic source, uh, you know, the more daring uh, and beautiful the, the thing you plunder and destroy for yourself is the more you heighten your own prestige. But we also have um, a Portuguese source and uh, several sources, and it's a recurring pattern. So it really does seem like these churches for 
for I think reasons connected to the description uh, of, the uh, of the temple in the Bible, but they were indeed paneled with gold on the inside. Um, and I think, I mean, in 1402, um, the Ethiopian ruler actually apparently requests um, somebody who in the Latin sources is called a, a, a spatiarum, so a swords maker or an armorer. Um, but swords are readily available in Ethiopia. And my hunch is that he would have been actually more used as a metal worker in general, because apparently prestigious metal work was just very important for these churches to begin with. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, response. We have another question um, from our research fellow, Dominic Somda. Dominic, could you kindly voice your question? Sure. Um, thank you very much. Um, this is a very general and simple question. Uh, would you mind discussing the genealogy of the idea of diplomacy? and especially how it emerged in, in Ethiopia, in medieval Ethiopia. And when you say genealogy, you mean um, that like there's a dynastic line of diplomacy or? No, not necessarily, although I would be very interested in that in that answer, but just the, 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 the idea like dip diplomacy is a, is a particular form of, of in political interaction uh, that, um, rely on in particular also hierarchical structure and idea of nation, et cetera. So I'm interested in understanding how, um, you know, the idea of diplomacy um, uh, emerged in Ethiopia, how, uh, why, it, why was it created? What, what were the precedent, how it existed also before uh, those encounters that you described earlier? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have, of course, a, a very long reaching back into the fourth century, a type of diplomacy that is very much um, part of the setup of the conception of the Aksumite kingdom, which is a predecessor kingdom in, in, the, in the Horn of Africa, um, through its connection that the head of the Ethiopian church always uh, was appointed by the patriarch of Alexandria, so the, what later becomes the Coptic church and the Coptic patriarch. Um, so in order for there to be um, a head of the church in Ethiopia, uh, a king in Ethiopia needed to send out embassies to whoever was ruling Egypt. And from the fifth century, sixth, seventh century, of course, um, you know, like there were different entities ruling Egypt. So if you needed to request a patriarch from a long distance away, that already bakes ideas about um, diplomacy into how you interact with the world in order to have the head of your church who is important because he can crown the uh, he can he can actually you know ordain priests and he can crown a ruler it, it becomes a very big problem we have several cases in Ethiopian uh, medieval quote unquote medieval history uh, or early history where um, if you don't have uh, a metropolitan you have a big problem you have problems in succession you have problems in appointing priests and whatnot um, so you do have, re reaching very far back, um, diplomatic missions that go to whoever rules Egypt, whether it's the Fatimids or the Ayyubids or later uh, the Mamluks, um, and specifically this diplomacy with different Christians. I mean, there's a Ge'er source um, that tells, it's a religious source, but it gives us a view on how Ethiopian rulers in the 15th century um, told their own people why they sent out the mission. So it's a source, um, it's, a, it's a homily, but it describes um, how King Dave, uh, David sends out um, his first mission to Venice uh, because he apprehends, like the, there's two Latin Christians, um, nobody quite knows who they are, they're described as uh, like uh, merchant travelers, uh, and they get apprehended because if you're a foreign Christian and come to a Solomonic Ethiopia, you get apprehended, you get brought to the court. It's a security feature, right? So, uh, and the Ethiopian king brings them, uh, or they get brought before the Ethiopian king who questions them and says, you know, who are you guys? Are you actually really Christian, uh, Christians? And he subjects them to a religious quiz about their Christianity to find out if these are actually really Christians. Uh, and, um, they tell him, or he asks them about the fate of the true cross, according to this text. 
Uh, and they tell him, well, all of the pieces of the true cross have been disseminated amongst the kings in the Latin West, all of the different kingdoms that you find in Europe. And then this text specifically says, oh, uh, Atzad Dawit also wanted a piece of the true cross. So he sends out this man, this stranger that had been brought to his court and says, if you bring me a piece of the true cross, I will richly reward you. So that is in a way, incidentally, how the first mission, according to this uh, source, makes its way. And the interesting thing is that this source also describes the aftermath. And it describes how this embassy was a massive success. No, so not only does a piece of the true cross apparently arrive back in Ethiopia or a piece that was understood as a part of the true cross, but also just all of these cartloads of beautiful fabrics and objects and what have you. It's like 40 folios of descriptions of foreign objects that get brought back. So it's a smashing success. Um, and that sort of, I mean, then it's really not surprising that his sons try to engage in the same thing because it brings you much glory and prestige as a king if you can do that. Thank you, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. Dr. Krebs, I am interested to, to know a little bit. Could you share a snippet of um, what we can expect from the next monograph, Africa Collecting Europe? Yeah, um, yeah, gladly. I mean, I'm in the process of finally, hopefully now sitting down to, to finish this. So both books draw from my PhD research, but I'm very glad that despite being German and there's a huge pressure in Germany that you need to, you need to publish your PhD immediately. And I didn't do that. And I had the excuse of going to Jerusalem, so being outside the German system for a bit. And then I dragged my feet because in my PhD, I didn't I didn't find the guts to say what I think, uh, like scholarship was wrong. It took me a long time to say, you know, I think this is wrong and I think I have a better, a better explanation of what we find here. Um, and so the second monograph also deals with that because we do have, what I could already show in my PhD, we have an import of, for example, foreign uh, icons and prestigious religious items. Um, so for example, Flemish panel painting, we have dozens of post-Byzantine icons that come from the Eastern Mediterranean that get brought to Ethiopia and given their own object histories where they're seen as painted by St. Luke himself and they're very holy and they have their own names and whatnot. And scholarship for the longest time has, uh, has said, well, these objects must have been gifted to the Ethiopians by European powers as part of their diplomatic, diplomatic missions. Now, as you can see from the book, um, it's the other way around, right? Like there were no European ambassadors that could gift something to Ethiopians to begin with because all of the impetus for this diplomatic exchange comes from the Ethiopian side. Latin Christian uh, embassies do not even get to Ethiopia until 150 years, 120 years later. So why are they there? Why are these foreign objects in Ethiopia? And we actually mm. have source evidence to show, well, it seems there was a royal active import. So we have sources in Amharic and in Ge'ez that say princesses of the Solomonic line used their own man money to send out priests to then buy religious items from the Eastern Mediterranean and bring them back to Ethiopia. And one of the objects that I showed, and I can maybe just very briefly show this to end with, um, this thing here, the painted enamel, um, has actually faulty Ge'ez writing, but it proclaims and says, this is the King Na'od, and this is the King Libna Dingle, and there is an Ethiopian source that indicates that it was actually commissioned in Limoges, France, by Na'od's wife for dynastic purposes. So we don't just have like these objects up here is what gets imported on royal order, but we apparently even have a commissioning of, of objects from abroad, which brings us to the, um, the title that I've preliminary picked for the book, Africa Collecting Europe, because if you're importing and, and drawing things from very far places to appropriate as your set of, for yourself and, and, and do things with them and even commission them, you're engaging in collecting practices. Uh, so that's hopefully what the book will okay. be. Wow, looking forward to that. 
Hey, one, any last um, reflections or arguments um, to this body of scholarship? Oh, absolutely nothing to top uh, what Verena has said. I think um, I will end with this. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, still looking at the audience. If no one has a question, um, I think we should wrap it up and say thank you very much, Dr. Verena Krebs, for this fantastic, this phenomenal body of literature, which we are all looking forward to finish reading. And I'm sure those that haven't started are very uh, encouraged to, to read it. I think it's a very important text, very uh, important way of thinking about history. And um, we look forward to your new book. Thank you so much, Hewan, for your input as well. We appreciate you. We appreciate you both for being here at Huma. And uh, we look, we hope you will, you will visit us again on our upcoming uh, um, seminars as well. We hope to see you again. Uh, just to let the audience know that um, tomorrow, in fact, in fact, this week is also full of seminars. On, on, on Tuesday, we have the Ethical humani humani Humanitarianisms uh, Seminar. It's kicking off tomorrow with panelists uh, Mahendra and Mahendra Shun Shunmugam, the Director uh, um, of Policy Implementation at the Department of Trade. And we have Dr. Jess Auerbach, who is a senior lecturer at Northwest University. We're kicking off the seminar tomorrow. Please make it a, a date. And on Wednesday, we are having the Pan-Africanism Seminar with Edeke Adebajo, which is at four o'clock. It's the Human African uh, Epistemologies Advanced Series. Um, and on Thursday, we have uh, the Huma Interdisciplinary Series with Lisa Akeson from University of Gothenburg. So this week has kicked off very well with Dr. Krebs literature and uh, with upcoming seminars are also very exciting. It's a jam packed week. Please make a date and be there. Divine has kindly shared the link in the chat. Thank you Divine for sharing the link. This session is being recorded. It will be available on our Facebook and our YouTube channels for you to access. And um, we look forward to having you in our upcoming seminars. Once again, thank you, Dr. Krebs, for your wonderful work. We appreciate you. Thank you, Hewan, for your input. We appreciate you as well. Fantastic work. Thank you so much. And that's the end of our um, book lunch series. Thank you. Thank you so much.